your clock. I, I know. I got the thumbs up. This is very exciting. Uh, welcome, everyone, here in the room and to those tuning in online for this panel discussing central bank digital coins. First and foremost, I want to remind you that we would love your participation and we're using the Slido app. So if you go to slido.com and in the little bar at the top, you put in CBDC, it will bring you here. I'm going to try and incorporate your questions as we go. So be kind, please. Um, we will do our best. And I also want to remind you on social, if you're sharing hashtag WEF22. Now, if there's one thing, and it might be the only thing up for debate that I think financial sector participants agree on at this moment is whether your bank, regulator, consumer, business, is that the current system can be more efficient. It can be more inclusive and it can be fairer. The big question is, how do we achieve that? And there are many ways of going about it. What if I told you 90% now of the world's central banks say they're investigating a central bank digital coins, whether pushed by the private sector, and I see some faces that I recognize in the audience, or working with the private sector, let's be clear. I think we all recognize that technology like central bank digital coins have the potential to reshape the financial system and revolutionize payments. Now, some central banks started years ago and they're represented on this fantastic panel. They're also providing lessons, I think, and challenges to other central banks. The question is, what do we need to know? What are the macroeconomic, the geopolitical consequences? What are the benefits, but also the challenges of rollout? Data privacy, security, scalability, just to name a few. At the heart of any currency, how do we ensure trust? Mm. Particularly given the great turbulence we see across financial markets, but specifically in private crypto markets today, and how new this concept is. We have to get it right first time. It has to be a benefit to users, but also minimize financial security and financial stability risks. I don't ask much. But I do ask much of what is a truly fantastic panel. Let me introduce them. The governor of the Central Bank of France, Francois Villeroy. Mm -hmm. Axel Lehman. Oh, nice. I like that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Good work. Um, Axel Lehman, chairman of the board of directors of Credit Suisse. Yes. Kristalina Giorgeva, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> and last but not least, Setaput Suthiwar Naraput, the Governor of the Central Bank of Thailand. <laughs> we're going to have some fun. I think it would be remiss of me not to begin with what we're seeing, as I mentioned, not only in broader financial markets, but in crypto markets in particular. We've got not-so-stable coins having significant issues. We've got governments that decided to legalize private crypto like Bitcoin. I don't want to mention Venezuela, but I just did. Now sitting on significant losses. Um, you name it, we've got turbulence. I think my first question to our entire panel is, um, what the heck's going on? <laughs> um, in many ways, quite frankly, but, but in this specifically, and to all of you, but I'm playing to, to, to my governors, whether Mm. maybe to Kristalina too, um, whether what we're seeing is the argument, a proof of concept perhaps, of central banks needing to lead the way in payment systems. Mm. Kristalina, I'll begin with you. Well, uh, when somebody promises you 20% return on something that is not backed by any assets, how would we normally call this thing? We would call it a pyramid. In other words, this is a pyramid in the digital age. But we should not be mistaken to immediately classify everything in the digital money world in a negative way because there are three categories the first one is central bank digital currencies. They are backed by the state and uh, they offer finality when transactions are settled. This is a universe that, as you said, 90% of countries are exploring. Who crossed the finish line first? The Bahamas with the sand dollar. But now we have Nigeria stepping there, and there are many pilots, of which the largest universe of a pilot 
which actually made me wake up and say, well, this thing is moving so fast that the International Monetary Fund has to embrace it. China with 100, a pilot with 128 million participants. Now, the second group, these are the stable coins. Some of them deserve the name because they are backed by assets and when they're backed by assets one to one, they're really stable. They look a little bit like money market funds, but they're money market funds in this digital space. And then we have lower degree of stability. The less there is a backing, the more you should be prepared to take the risk of this thing blowing in your face, which is what happened some days ago. I want to be very, very uh, direct that I do feel the, for the people who lost money because part of the reason they lost money is not really being well educated on sure. this new investment world. Um, and I want to go to the third universe, the, the crypto that is really not pretending to be backed up by anything, not designed to be backed, backed, backed up by anything. It is really the trust that is built in a way that brings value. It is an investment class. When we say I always get upset and then I get occasional hate tweets, when I say that Bitcoin may be called coin, but it's not money. Why? Because a prerequisite for something to be money is to be a stable store of value. So you actually can plan around it. And when uh, the first country embraced Bitcoin and I was asked, what did we think at the fund? I said, well, it's a sovereign decision. Doesn't make it a good decision. And now we have another country that You actually that said to me, just that. because you can doesn't mean you should. Yes. And I'll never forget that. But yes, <laughs> that's very true. So uh, my my point here is that there are very important responsibilities for the central banks and also for other regulators, regulators of financial services, regulators of these asset class, to make sure that everybody can step into this world with some confidence that we understand that for CBDCs, the biggest question is interoperability. How are they going to connect to each other? But for stable coins, for um, crypto assets, it is responsibility for some regulation and financial education. I would beg you not to pull out of the importance of this world because of what Julia said. It offers us all faster service, much lower cost, and more inclusion. But only if we separate apples from oranges and bananas. Uh, and that is our job. We have a huge responsibility to do it well. Yes, because sometimes the pips squeak, and we're mm -hmm. seeing that right now. Um, I'm going to come back to you because you didn't actually answer my question on whether central banks can do this best, but I'm going to ruminate over that question. Francois, come in here. Loaded question. Where payments are concerned, do central banks have to be at the core of it, or can private companies perhaps do a better job? I apologize. No, don't. I, I didn't answer it, but I know Francois will. No, you can do it now. You can do it now. Wait, wait. Oh, well, I can, it's do you think one sentence. Go ahead, one sentence. Yes. Central banks have a role. Private sector has a role. <laughs> Private sector innovates much better than, than, than normally, well, central banks innovate too, but private sector <laughs> bursts with innovation. But central banks can bring this finality of payments that yeah. private sector really cannot, right? Okay, now Francois is going to say, oh, Crystalia, no, 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 so no. nonsense. No. Let, let me be very short. Uh, starting about the fact that you mentioned, Julia, that currency is about trust yeah. mm. for centuries, and it's about technological innovations for centuries also. Remember of the banknotes. <laughs> no, none of us was alive 
two or three centuries ago, but it was a tremendous technological progress yes. for central bank currency at that time. And in order to have the best of trust, which comes more from central bankers and the public side, and technological innovation, which comes more from the private sector, there is a partnership. Mm -hmm. And for decades, there has been a partnership in issuing money and in organizing the payment system. Uh, so one word about crypto mm -hmm. and one word about CBDC on this partnership. Crypto, I always speak of crypto assets and not cryptocurrencies, and not by chains, because yes. as Kristalina just said, they are not a reliable currency. They are not a reliable mean of payment in order to be a currency. Somebody must be responsible for the value. Nobody is responsible for the value of cryptos. And it must be accepted universally as a means of exchange. It's not. The more interesting story is probably CBDC. Uh, and here, I say it for Axel and for all the industry, we also have to build a partnership. I know there are some worries from banks saying, look, we play a role, at, not, not from Credit Suisse, for sure. Thank you, but thank you. <laughs> we, which I'm glad to We're not going to He's a good guy. It's a whole no, panel. Uh, saying, look, we issue commercial bank currency, which is true. All of us have credit cards with mm -hmm. bank currency, and we are more or less uh, very active in the payment system. It doesn't mean that in the future, commercial banks should disappear from there. But we have to build a partnership in order to give to citizens mm. and to give also to corporates and financial institutions still access to central bank currency with the best technology. We, we, we cannot have the technology on one side, cryptos, mm -hmm. and trust on the other side, old style central bank currency. Let us keep it together. It's so fascinating because there's a million ways I could take this. Um, but obviously, proponents of crypto would say, look, we lost trust in, in central Absolutely. banks a long time ago. You've inflated your own uh, currency. My impression, away. Julia, is more than in recent weeks, citizens have lost trust in cryptos. But um, <laughs> they, uh, And broader financial markets. More, more than in central banks, <laughs> without <laughs> any doubt. Um, I know, but you're now in charge of restraining some of the reasons like inflation. But, I mean, again, a different panel. Um, I hear you. Um, Axel? There's a lot in there. What, um, what the heck is yeah. going on? Yeah, what the heck? No, because we've run out of time to answer. Okay, I will what tell you. Question. I tell you all what is ongoing. No. <laughs> Look, I think... Yeah, um, is there a, I mean, it's nascent technology, relatively. Yes. So we can answer the question on a different panel again about whether the stability comes as technology improves. I mean, in the private sector too, but... but you know, CBDCs, whatever they look like in the future, they're not necessarily going to be the holy grail. There are many options no. and will come right. to it, be it fast payments, be it alternatives. I guess what I'm asking today is for, for the majority of people that are what the heck about crypto, never mind what's going on, what central banks are offering and what, what the options are going to be one day. Um, how do we need to think about this today? Yeah, I think it's the way I look at it is, you know, what is... What do we try to fix? What do we try right, to address? And back. when you go back and you said it roughly some 10 years ago or eight years ago here at the WEF, it was blockchain and that will revolutionize and banks are gone and everything will be completely different. We are still here, fortunately. So glad that I can sit here on that uh, on that chair. Governments so were you had then obviously, as Kristalina clearly said, you know, cryptocurrencies, crypto assets. That's one thing. Then the stable or not so stable coins in the middle. And now we talk about central bank digital currencies. So central banks strongly feel, at least in certain jurisdictions, there's a certain need that needs to be addressed. And I think we didn't talk about yet. There are two ways on central bank digital currencies. One is the more the wholesale piece. So basically. Our interactions as a commercial bank with the, with, the, with the central bank. And here, I would say it makes a lot of sense. This is new technology coming in. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it, advantage, disadvantage, but at the end, it's an efficiency game and maybe it's a security game. Makes a lot of sense. A completely different ball game it is when you start to talk about the retail, retail. you know, central bank uh, 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 digital uh, currency, not because it's digital. I, I, I can pay with digital with my mobile. It has nothing to do with central bank digital currency. But I think the fundamental change is the underlying business model is 
as I, as a retail customer, as a citizen, will have an account with the central bank. I don't have just an account with a commercial bank. I have it with the central bank, which has a lot of advantages for me. It's safe, it feels good. But uh, yeah, there are some challenges uh, with this because the central bank is ultimately, you know, it's a, it's a public office. Uh, uh, commercial banks are under a commercial regime. Central banks are not under a commercial regime. What about interest rates on an account like that? When things are going well, how does this look like? Oh, on a bank run, how does this look like? Is this accelerating the bank run because I have a safe account with somebody? So these are then the fundamental questions. That's why I think it's excellent to see that 90%, 87 I think, uh, central banks are are looking into that and mm -hmm. try, and uh, we need to figure out how that all can work. But having said what is ongoing, I think we are now what, for 10 years, 15 years in that new technology, blockchain. We see now the, whoop, the market is collapsing. Okay, uh, let's see in five or 10 years, something will survive. Something will survive, and I think we should all make sure we understand what that will be. We've been through many cycles through technologies of all kinds that go up and down, and new things come and benefits are created. Um, set to put, last but not least, you can answer the what the heck question, but you can also answer some of the questions that have been <laughs> posed here. They've answered I the, know. The what the heck really Yes, well, have because to you've add, done so wholesale and you've looked at the retail payments, and you've been going on this since 2018, and I think you have sort of strong views on takeaways about all of these things and, and the benefits and the challenges. Yeah, maybe I could share some of the, the, the lessons that we've learned yeah. from um, working in the, in, the, in the CBDC space. We started off, as, as Julia mentioned, about um, five years or so, doing a bunch of um, proof of concepts. Um, started off with wholesale CBDC, then we went to cross-border um, mm -hmm. wholesale CBDC because that, that's an area where we think there's an obvious lot of pain points. Uh, cross-border payments and you know the whole correspondent banking system yep. doesn't work terribly well and you know it takes a long time and everything yeah. so th there, there was a problem there to solve um, and uh, we started off working together with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority um, establishing a, a cross-border uh, um, um, payment corridor and uh, that since has been uh, extended on a more multilateral basis uh, it's called the Enbridge project um, the PBOC Bank of China is involved and the UAE is involved in that and the, and the BIS as well so, and, and our next phase now is, is to, to, to think um, more on the retail space, and we're looking at doing a, um, a pilot, a limited pilot, nothing on the size of China, uh, in fourth quarter of this year. Um, so I should caveat this by saying that these, these are testing and experimentation. We haven't rolled it out yet. At one point, no. again, you know, there, yeah. are a lot of, there are a lot of banks looking at it, right? But the number of central banks have actually done this, right? This, this has been yeah, relatively uh, limited. And I think, I think that's important to keep in mind because um, it, it's got to be clear what problem <coughs> we're trying to solve. So, so with that background, if I may, uh, some of the takeaways and whatnot. First point, um, be on the technology. Uh, one thing we discovered, particularly in the wholesale CBDC cross-border um, project, um, is that blockchain, the way it's set up, is, is it's really for, it's very good for things that are to be open and transparent. But when you try to put in kind of anonymity in it, it's very, it, it, it affects the, you know, the, the ability of it to scale. Data privacy. So, yeah. Um, so, when we, you know, in, in the, in the cross-border wholesale CBDC, you didn't want everybody to kind of see what transaction you were doing, right? You wanted the people that were party transacting to see, but not the other people to see that. But when you put in these anonymity things, it really affected the computational problems, and then, you know, it made it that much more difficult to scale. There's an irony here. One. About, there's an irony here, just as an aside, about the criticisms of, of blockchain technology in a way by those that perhaps don't understand is that you, you can hide in some way behind it and mm. you're just making the point that this is oh. actually so transparent in this regard that actually data privacy becomes it, Yeah, yeah. Forgive it, me for interrupting. Not at all. Second point on the technology that we, we discovered is, is uh, programmability. It, it, it's a selling point, but it also has its drawbacks. Um, if you think about um, smart contracts, they're, they're, they're supposed to self-execute, right? Um, which means that you got to specify all that stuff kind of up front. So there's a lot of ex ante burden trying to specify all the conditions, all the states of the world, because you don't have recourse to that kind of ex post, you know, go to the courts and settle and, and, and get uh, um, um, some kind of remedial measures. But that's, that's a very difficult thing to do. I mean, think about how smart contracts would be able to handle something when foreseen, like sanctions on Russia. 
right? So contracts, smart contracts, which might look smart under some circumstances, under different circumstances, aren't going to look terribly smart. So that's you know an issue. We, we found this with, with, with uh, when we were doing again, doing the, the wholesale cross-border CBDC project. The, the last set of uh, uh, points and takeaway on, on lessons would be on on um, risks and design. Um, that um, the devil really is in the detail in terms of de design. I think a lot of the risks that people talk about in CBDC, um, you can't talk about in a blanket way. It really depends how you design it. So, for example, you know, if you do a two-tier system, right, that, that avoids a lot of the, the risks that people concern about, you know, disseminating banks or the privacy concerns that the central bank knows exactly what you're doing. Um, uh, if you do uh, CBDCs that don't pay any interest, then again, it reduces the, the, the danger of um, uh, you know, runs on banks, uh, setting Multi limits years on of CBDC. Not any interest, but yes, go or, or if you're worried about currency substitution, which is something that mm -hmm. people are also yeah. concerned about, which I personally don't think is a, that big of an issue for most economies. But if you're worried about it, then you can design it so that, say, non residents can't hold CBDC. Sure. Right? So, so there are ways around design which can reduce the risk. So those would be the takeaways. The design is critical, and you only get one shot at this, because yeah. to the mm -hmm. point about trust, again, you get it wrong. And so your experiences, too. And, and actually, to that point, though, about the, the foreign exchange risk as well, I just wonder whether it makes a central bank digital coin one day easier in a big trade area, like a Eurozone that all uses the same currency, or the United States, for example. Just thinking out loud, but please, your experiences. No, I'm very happy to, that thanks to this panel and thanks to, to Axel and Setaput, we speak about all sales CBDC. Because yeah. usually, yeah. the it's blind okay. spot, yeah. the missing link of the discussion. I will say one word on retail, but we believe in all sales. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the yeah. Banque de France, we have also run nine experiments already. We published last November uh, uh, some takeaways. Uh, if I can insist on two purposes we strongly believe in. First is tokenization of financial markets. We will have two legs, cash and securities. And second, as you said, is cross borders. So the use case are quite obvious. They don't interest much politicians and public opinion, but we will have, I strongly believe, all sales CBDC. And by the way, we decided with the ECB to create a second work stream. On retail CBDC, Axel, you are right, it raises more questions. Uh, but this is where public interest oh, is. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say that on this field, I don't have all the answers yet. We will have a prototype in the ECB uh, till the end of 23. But here, again, I think we should build a partnership with banks. This has been the history of currency and payments, again. If we have a ceiling on CBDC holdings, if accounts are managed by commercial banks and not by the central banks, uh, I don't believe that the issue of currency substitution, for example, would in that case be, be a, real, a real story. To, to give you a very simple commitment, we in the Banque de France had private accounts till 2004. Okay. I don't want to reopen any of them. So if we have CBDC, it will be done with the commercial the banks, banks and yeah. clearly using their skills. Again, it's a partnership. You know, it's okay. interesting because I remember when we were talking about wholesale, just for those that perhaps are watching going, what, what do you mean wholesale, retail? It's bank to bank, we're talking commercial banks to commercial banks that send money between countries around the world. But then when we're talking about retail, we're talking about consumers. And, and I think this comes back to one of the critical questions and one of the reasons why I actually was interested in this in the beginning was remittances. And we've talked mm -hmm. about this. For people that are trying to send money abroad to families for whatever reason, there is such high fees and so much money lost. And it's, for me, one of the fundamental questions is, how do we make that better? I think it's $48 billion mm -hmm. lost in fees and in, in remittances uh, on an annual basis. Are we suggesting then that we never get to a point? And we haven't also answered the question of whether, are we point blank saying at this stage, a private company can't achieve this? Because, you know, there are participants in the audience, there are members of the audience who are, are tackling this very thing. Are we saying that CBDs are not the right solution and are fast payments perhaps an, alter an alternate um, option for the retail consumer? And could a private company achieve what you're saying is a huge challenge for many reasons mm. for central banks? Big questions. Yeah. Well, uh let, let, let's start from what we have. Today, 
a um, consumer in New York City can pay for food in a Chinese restaurant with <coughs> a pay system, Ali, Ali Pay, in RMBs. So already the private initiative has moved this transborder payments, but you can only do it within a corporate world to which you belong with your phone-based uh, app. Uh, what we do not yet have is international settlement based on CBDCs. Right. CBDCs are not yet internationalized. But this is where the potential to cut cost of remittances is. Today, on average, 6.3%. So you are a worker and you want to send money to your family in euros, in dollars. 6.3% is the cut of the intermediary. And obviously, this is an opportunity for advancement to use technology to make advancements. Where is the difficulty? The difficulty is that today, monetary policy in a country, or as it is the case in the Eurozone, within the Eurozone, is defined by the central bank, the Fed, the European Central Bank. And this monetary policy applies to the territory, the jurisdiction, how could central bank digital currency cross borders and go into another jurisdiction? Would that create a risk of currency substitution? So the, uh, everybody says, I want uh, ECB's uh, CBDC. I want the, uh, yeah. the e euro. The euro. Yeah. Uh, and these are unresolved uh, issues, but it doesn't mean they cannot be resolved. This is why, from the fund, we are advocating to think about this world of digital money as a global public good. And in a recent discussion in Zurich, where we, we both were, what we advocated for is to have a public platform. So when protocols are, are agreed, it, this public platform can connect different CBDCs. It can be, there can be interoperability. The same way you would transfer euros from one country sure. to another, you do it using CBDCs. We feel that we are actually a bit behind the curve. In, in other words, regulators, national regulators, and uh, uh, standard settling bodies like the um, um, uh, FSB, the, the Financial Stability Board, that we have to work on it. Good news, FSB started work in 19 streams, very systematic, very detailed. Not so good news. In meanwhile, we may be in a situation in which Jurisdictions make decisions, but they do not underpin interoperability. Actually, what you said about BIS, the Ban for International Settlement, they have done something wonderful. They created an innovation lab, and it is connecting countries. So when they work on their, their uh, pilots, on their proof of concept, they actually share. can partner, can share. So we can build that public platform for the benefit of uh, consumers. Uh, and and there, what would be the role of, of banks? Well, I personally I am on the view that we need banks as intermediary between money and investments. Your savings and investment somewhere. Whether it is in the traditional money world, the fiat currency world, yeah, or in the new digital world, we need specialized institutions to make sure savings can work. 
for growth, for jobs. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it is impossible to have um, retail CBDCs. I just, I personally don't quite see no, yeah. why should we do that? Why do we want central banks to venture yes. in, in a world where Certainly not you guys in, are. In, in well established yeah. economies. That's a question. What, yeah. what would be the purpose? But, you know, back to your question, I don't think it's public sector, central banks versus commercial banks. I think it's a really collaborative effort in this regard. Yes. Everybody yep. has to play a role. So, for example, we were with you, that was called Pro Project Jura. Uh, working together on the wholesale central bank, Helvetia with the Swiss National Bank, we see that is absolutely feasible, uh, it will give great efficiency gains, but we also get the sense of, you know, we all have our legacy IT environment, and that will take a lot of time until yes. we go there. On the retail side, even today, most banks offer you multi-currency credit cards where yep. you can have basically at zero transaction costs, you can mm -hmm. settle your bills in various currencies. So there's a lot of development ongoing, but I would caution it will take some time. There's no Define silver it. bullet. How long? How long are we talking? Uh, in the case of the ECB, there is a precise answer. We will have the prototype till the end of 23 or early 24, and then we will decide and take three years if we have a broad euro. So it could come N26, yeah. early 27. <laughs> I don't know if it's good news for Axel, but it could be good news for euro area citizens. Seth Tepot, I want you to come in here because, I mean, of all these things that we're discussing, you know, again, you have real-world experience too, and I, I read your entire report on the wholesale, the retail, the, the fast payments, everything that you've gone through, and, and the thing that leapt out at me, and it goes back to remittances. And also, what is the, the problem that we're trying to solve here? Yeah. Who is the ultimate beneficiary? Mm -hmm. you know, do we need to get involved and add more layers or less layers? Um, you found a 50% reduction in cost. Um, and it took 80% less time to settle transactions. Because this is another thing, you know, you try and send money abroad and great, but it takes five, six days to mm -hmm. settle. And, mm -hmm. and Christine, this is personal for you too, because, you know, you have family in Ukraine that you, you use D-payments to send to too. And, you know, again, another thing I won't forget. So to put, you know, this is not the Holy Grail, but, but, but <laughs> are we, are we, by any means, um, are we at least answering the right questions mm. in what we're asking here? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I know this is a panel on CBDC, and uh, like I said, we've done a lot of fair amount of work on it. We'll yeah. continue to do so. Um, but I have to say that uh, there's a lot to be said, and there's probably a good return on effort from trying to improve existing infrastructure mm -hmm. and yep. putting in things like fast payment systems. We, we, we've, we've had pretty good success uh, with putting in a fast payment system. We have a prompt pay system we put in place. We have a population of 60, uh, 70 million, sorry, and they're about 60-odd you know, million uh, ID numbers. Um, uh, now it's like 40, 40, 40 plus million transactions a day. It's grown like five-fold over the five, past five years. And one thing that's been wonderful um, is, is, is the benefits of inclusion. Um, so we had mm. now um, associated with that like QR codes for merchants. Right. Mm. There's 7.2 million uh, QR codes. So now we literally have like sidewalk vendors, you know, on their carts. They have a QR code, you know, and you, you know they can get payments uh, uh, very very efficiently. Mm. So so we, we've we've got. I think fast payment systems are are can give you a lot of. It, it's a low hanging fruit and give you a lot of benefits. And even on the cross border side. One thing we did um, uh, about a year ago was we connected it was uh, the fast payment system of Thailand, Prompt Pay, with the one in Singapore, uh, Pay Now, mm -hmm. is the first um, fast payment linkage in the world. And, and now, you know, you can send money. Um, if I know, like, someone's mobile number in Singapore, I can send it pretty much instantaneously at very low fees. Whereas before, you, know, you had to go to the branch and mm -hmm. fill in forms, and it would take you, like, three days to, and, and, and a lot of money in terms of fees to send the stuff. So, so there's a lot that you can do with the existing infrastructure, existing technology, I mean, and improve it. Blah, blah, blah. And it depends the on where you are in the world, because I think this is important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you know my fear? I, we went through a stage, and you'll remember it, in, in financial markets, where if you added Bitcoin or something to your name as a, as a company, your share price would soar. <laughs> and, and when I see and read that 90% approximately of looking at this, and I just wonder whether it's sort of almost the fear of, oh my goodness, uh, if we don't, look like we're mm. investigating this, we're gonna lose ground to private companies or we're gonna look like we're idiots or, you know, almost the stage we have to talk about something and think that, look like you know what you're saying and doing even when you don't. And, and so that's my fear in, in this 
sphere is, is sort of what's the problem we're trying to solve? Are there solutions? And, you know, we, we, we're sort of trying to make it, and maybe this is a media problem, uh, one of them, mm. um, that we make it into an us or them when it doesn't have to be. You know, in the end, we're trying to help people. Mm -hmm. It's not about the public sector. It's not about the private sector. It shouldn't necessarily sure. be a race. There's a, there's a good way to do this. And, and I guess the hope is that we're, we're, that's the direction we're headed in. Are we? I guess so, yeah. I mean, you see it on who's sitting on that panel. I truly don't see that competition at that point uh, of time. And you were a lot of critical on, on retail uh, uh, central bank digital currencies. I think in well-established economies and so on, that you really need to wonder what is the purpose or what is the real benefit. In other countries or in geographies where you know they are very broad and vast, that may, might make a lot of sense. So I believe here as a kind of uh, there's no no right and wrong answers. Let's see how things are evolving and they emerging. And look, we as a bank, we are fully aware we need to we need to reduce transaction uh, cost. We need to make things more accessible, be more inclusive, make it swifter, make the user uh, the, the exper experience usage much more friendly. So we are all fighting on that because we are in a competition with other banks. So. Do you think it's an existential crisis for banks? Um, I don't think we feel it that way, but I would say, yeah, you need to be part yep. of that. Yeah. You need to know the strategy and your way forward because otherwise you, you can get sidelined very quickly. It sometimes it takes two, three years, and then you wake up one morning and say, oh, the world has changed, and that was not part of it. Can I just make a point very quickly? Then everybody can come in. Because for the Bank of Thailand, you've said, look, no, no private companies are going to be involved in, in crypto. You can invest as a private investor if you want to in we, digital assets. We don't assets. want to see it as a means of payment. Yeah, yeah. but as a means of payment, you're saying, uh-uh, it's us or, or nothing. Yeah, I mean, um, again, uh, crypto is, is, is regulated by the SEC. Yeah. Um, so you know, it's, for, for us, it's fine if you want to invest in it, uh, caveat emptor and all that. Yeah. Um, but uh, we don't want to see it as a, as a means of payment. Um, is that because the way the whole world's headed? I guess this is my question. Sorry, you can. No, no. Just because it's not appropriate for the reasons we decided. I mean, I mean we've we've discussed it, yeah. but is that where the whole world's headed? If there is a ceiling, which I believe will be the case for retail CBDC, it will be mainly a means of payment. I do agree. It, it won't ceiling, be. Yeah. It won't be an investment. Can, can I add one no, word? Go for it. it. Do, do yeah. Can I add one word about your question of timing, which is absolutely key? Yeah. We central banks have a bit more time than the private sector. <laughs> it's an advantage, but we should not abuse this advantage. <laughs> uh, it means that not all innovations are perhaps welcome in the long run. But CBDC is not the only innovation. We cannot say the only innovation which is interesting is ours. Mm. If it's felt this way, it would be, it would be a catastrophe. So uh, I really think that we, we have to reconcile two completely opposite worlds, which are stability and innovation. Mm -hmm. And we are responsible for financial stability. stability. Mm -hmm. But stability without innovation is conservative. And it will die. But innovation without stability will lack trust. So it's our job. But we are completely open to consider that CBDC is an innovation, not the only one. It's not the holy grail, but we should seriously study it. Because yeah. if not, we will deprive our fellow citizens sure. from the access to central bank in the next decade, which would be a huge regression for the people's well-being. Mm. Okay, so we're going to fast forward five years, because mm -hmm. I think that's about what we were saying. I'll ask you, and also with a little caveat in that, as you said, sand dollar was the first, but it's a teeny fraction. Yes. It's early days, but what? Yep. It's 0.1% 0 .1 0 .1 mm -hmm. of, yep. of transactions. Okay, Yes. fast forward five years. Do we have a central bank digital coin out there in the world that is being utilized on a daily basis, whether it's wholesale or retail, and it becomes a superior system? Francois, yes or no? Uh, we have several experiments which are not very far from that. Yep. They are not yet generalized, but they could be, let's say, the next three years, probably. It will go quicker on the wholesale side, yes. I guess, and because it raises less sensitive questions. By the way, Julia, if I may, yeah. 
in CBDC, the last C is currency and not coins. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's a quite significant difference. <laughs> <laughs> details, details. Um, what proportion of transactions is it to the point about the sand dollar and the 0.1% of transactions admittedly early days? Let's say we have central bank digital currency. No, if I am on the wholesale side, cross-border can play yeah. a very significant yeah. role. How in much? What proportion? The setup said, but it won't help yet for household. It's why we are working on another agenda, a G20 agenda. I co-chaired with my South African colleague uh, a group with nine very precise objectives on speed, cost, accessibility of remittances, and it does not rely on CBDC. So we have other uh, yes. ways of innovating with newcomers, etc. CBDC is not the monopoly of innovation uh, or, or of progress. But if we central banks said, look, we have been relying on banknotes for two centuries, we will still rely on banknotes for the next century, we would miss something, obviously. Yes, mm -hmm. Axel. Mm -hmm. No, I'm quite I'm glad to hear what you're saying, uh, Francois, on, on the whole, say, uh, digital currency. Uh, digital currency, not coin. Uh, I am also a believer that will come in five years, yes. What I try to say is obviously, you know, we still have those huge legacy environment, they need to migrate as well, so we will not yet see all the benefits coming through, but it will come and will be much more efficient, uh, also probably much more secure, uh, lowering transaction costs. On the retail side, I'm much more skeptical uh, certainly call it for the you know, established economies much more, much more. Christalina? Well, in five years, there will be uh, CBDCs uh, that are, I cannot give you percentage, is it five, is it 10, is it 50, but would be quite present in, uh, in the world. Um, on the retail side, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of a developing country where e-money yeah. is already profoundly impactful. So, as you Where keep are we asking, going? what is the problem <laughs> we are trying to yeah. solve? Mm -hmm. um, and I also think, and this may be me being so mature, not to say out mature, <laughs> that, that uh, I think there would be space for uh, fiat money of some uh, uh, modality in five years still, and maybe in 10 years. Because if, when you look at one of the most advanced countries in Europe, Sweden, when the war started in Ukraine, the demand for banknotes rapidly increased. Mm -hmm. Why? Fear of cyber attack. So we have, to, we have to see how the world evolves and not be ideological, be very pragmatic about the decisions uh, we take. And, and we should have talked about that, and you've warned about that as well with the sand dollar in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. that the, the more digital you are, the more at risk you are of, mm -hmm. of, yep. of um, cyber attacks, particularly at this moment in time. Put Five years? Um, For uh, you. For yes. <laughs> right, let's make it specific. Oh. Oh. Wholesale, maybe. Retail, no. That would be my yeah. short answer. And again, it, 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 it's got to do with that balance. Uh, Francois put it very eloquently. When you think about innovations, right? The yeah. benefits are what pain point you're trying to address, and you counterbalance it with the, with the risk and the unintended consequences. consequences. And that trade-off is much clearer for wholesale than for retail. Absolutely. I love that you're I, I would be slightly more positive for retail, if I may. There are more questions to solve, I agree. But if we think of El Salvador, for instance, Cristalina, mm. I would prefer El Salvador citizens not to have only bitcoins right. and to have access to e-euro or, or e-dollar, we, we will see. But it would be a progress. So there is a need. We will see how we answer the mm -hmm. questions. Uh, but I'm sure we will have all sale, and we need to bet we will have retail. But we'll see. Yeah. Hmm. That opens up all sorts of questions Actually, about El Salvador's will, will government central bank doing yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question at the end, then? Does the Eurozone's digital currency come before a US dollar coin currency? Or currency, currency also. Currency. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we should have invited Jay, Jay Paul. No, 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 I'm asking I you because not. you've given me a timeline on no, the years. Uh, <laughs> so far, if, but they published a white book, as you I know. know. A very interesting one, uh, yes. which is open for consultation, uh, which is at least neutral, so it's not negative, let me express it this way. We'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
Uh, I think that what is happening in the crypto world could be an acceleration of central bank digital currency because th mm. there is a doubt now on, on the crypto world and there is still a need for technology. Mm. Having said that, if this is one field where Europe can lie ahead, the US, I will not complain. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's called a diplomatic answer, but we got there in the end. But China, China is the ultimate winner. But Ch China has advanced a lot. It has not internationalized uh, its pilot, uh, but uh, it is offering uh, people visiting China the ability to be part of the pilot. The ultimate trial. So uh, I think uh, China is telling us all that uh, the world is changing and they have done it very effectively with uh, private payment systems. And now the, the state is saying, wait a minute, we actually want to have an upper hand in this uh, world, and they're moving. Uh, so we better all be forward leaning on something that is moving so fast. There's a message in that. I'm being told, time out. Ah, Your panelists, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Julia. Really